cut. Yeah. The others are written on the list of the hard to bring over. <laughs> so we have this one in case no one ever knows what it's kind of like scratching their head. Yeah, okay. Hopefully they'll be smarter like this. I think they will. That'd be great. <laughs> I'll think okay. of another one. All right, welcome back. Let's get started on our next set of excellent talks. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Laura Stein. Laura studies the causes of behavioral plasticity and its consequences on evolutionary patterns. She received her PhD from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where she studied transgenerational plasticity in sticklebacks from a novel perspective, focusing on the effects of fathers on their offspring. Another aspect of her PhD work drew connections between molecular mechanisms underlying juvenile developmental plasticity and transgenerational plasticity using a genome-wide expression approach. In all, her research approach integrates behavioral observations in the lab and field, genomics, and neural mechanism approaches. Laura is currently an NSF postdoctoral fellow at Colorado State University, where she's using these tools to work in a new system, guppies, some of which we'll hear about today in addition to her work in sticklebacks. Based on a photo on her website, I'll also say that Laura has impressive skills in the illustration of fishes and with dry erase markers nonetheless. It is no easy feat. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Stein. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and I want to thank the committee very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and to see all these wonderful talks. So today, as you heard, I'm going to talk a little bit about transgenerational plasticity and how this might affect the colonization of novel environments across a couple of systems, hopefully guppies, if I can get to them. So this it doesn't work, so I'm going to do this. Um, so as we have already spent the morning hearing and talking about phenotypic plasticity is ubiquitous across organisms. Um, we've heard of lots of general examples. So if you raise a plant under the sun versus in cloudy conditions, um, they can produce two different phenotypes, even though they are the same genotype. And similarly, grasshoppers, if you raise them in high densities, they will produce different phenotypes than if they are raised um, in isolated conditions. So if plasticity can allow organisms to persist under new conditions, then plasticity may play a role in the colonization of novel environments. So it's worth thinking about what types of plasticity might be important for colonization and persistence in new environments. So to answer this question, we might think about how individuals gain information about their environment. So for example, here we have a young bird who may or may not experience an environment with hawks, a predator. So in a predator-rich environment, anti-predator phenotypes can be key for reproductive success and offspring survival. So an individual may gain information about their environment via their evolutionary history, for example, a non-plastic response. However, if the environment is fluctuating, producing anti-predator phenotypes may incur fitness costs. You may not be able to grow as big. You may not produce as many offspring. So another way individuals can gain information about their environment is through direct experience or juvenile developmental plasticity. However, in this case, as you might imagine, gaining information about your environment can be extremely costly. You might get eaten. So wouldn't it be great if parents could talk to their offspring, so to speak, and let them know about the environment that they are likely to encounter? If parents can prepare, can prepare offspring for predators, this can increase the offspring's chances of survival. So therefore, transgenerational plasticity, otherwise known as parental effects, are a particularly potent form of plasticity that occurs when the environment experienced by a parent influences offspring phenotypes and may influence adaptation to novel environments. Parental effects is often studied through a maternal lens. So we know that maternal care is important. Within a species, there is lots of variation in maternal care, and this variation can have profound effects on offspring development. We also know that mothers are capable of affecting their offspring prior to birth. So experiences during pregnancy affects offspring development across taxa. As offspring have a direct physical link to their mother, it is fairly easy to imagine how maternal experience can influence offspring. So for example, transfer of hormones into developing embryo via egg yolk or a placenta. Mothers can transmit information about maternal condition or the current environment. Um, and so maternal stressors may also negatively impact offspring development. So maternal care and maternal effects are now becoming more appreciated as generators of phenotypic variation, although there is still quite a bit of controversy surrounding whether or not they are adaptive and whether or not they have long-lasting evolutionary implications. 
But what about dads? Can they affect offspring in similar ways to mothers? So the biological reality is that most animals have two parents. In many animals, fathers contribute directly to parental care. Many taxa exhibit biparental care, including insects, fish, birds, and of course, mammals. Indeed, 80% of birds and 6% of mammals exhibit biparental care. Further, many animals exhibit exclusively paternal care. In fish, of the species that provide care, 50% are exclusively paternal. Fish are the most diverse of the vertebrate taxa and include one of the most extreme examples of paternal-only care, of course, the seahorse, um, in which males of some species even exhibit pseudoplacentas. Yet despite the prevalence of direct paternal care, little is known about whether fathers vary in care provided in the same way that mothers do and how this natural variation is influenced by ecological and evolutionary pre pressures. So today, and the focus of my dissertation, and in general, what I'm really interested in is can plasticity within a generation, parental experience, but whether by fathers or mothers, can this facilitate rapid adaptation, potentially via transgenerational mechanisms? So I began my work by using the three-spined stickleback as a model system. These are an adorable little fish um, in which male stickleback provide exclusive parental care. So males develop these nice blue bodies and red throats. They defend territories, build nests, and females spawn and then, uh, in the nests and then leave forever. Um, so in this way, we can actually separate pre-fertilization maternal effects from post-fertilization paternal effects. Uh, males can have one to three clutches per season, and parental care is absolutely necessary for offspring survival. So under natural conditions, offspring are going to be directly interacting with their father um, throughout their development. And just to show you what some of these behaviors look like and that I will be talking about, I'm going to show you this video to orient you. This is a male, this is his nest. And so some of the parental care that males provide is, if I can get it to start, there it goes. Um, they will poke at the nest, remove debris, dead eggs. They will also fan the eggs. This oxygenates them and clears out carbon dioxide. And then they will also um, adjust the nesting material. I don't know why it slowed down. I apologize. By gluing the nest. So they actually produce this protein called spigen from their kidneys that they will uh, put over the nest while they are parenting. In the field, males must also defend the nest against predators and conspecifics, and they um, are highly aggressive, spend a lot of time doing this. So here is a nest that is being attacked by California roach, a small minnow, and the male is going to come in and vigorously defend his, his babies. He will if the video actually played right. But you can see him chasing, the, chasing them away as best as, as you can. So Stickleback uh, provide an excellent system for examining the evolutionary patterns of parental care. Um, they originated in marine environments and have undergone adaptive radiation in the last 10,000 years. At the end of the last ice age, as um, more freshwater environments became available, they have repeatedly colonized uninhabited freshwater habitats. The marine ancestral form is extant and thought to have remained relatively unchanged. Um, and so we can actually uh, directly compare this marine ancestor to multiple independently derived freshwater populations, many of which are locally adapted. Predation is a strong selective pressure in stickleback, and as they have repeatedly invaded freshwater environments, they have developed predictable morphology and behavior based on predation regime. So in marine environments and in many freshwater environments, we have these fish predators, and, um, where, and we tend to get larger, more robust spines and larger body sizes in environments with fish predators. In freshwater environments with invertebrate predators, such as these odonate larvae, we see, tend to see things like smaller spines. So we can exploit these predictable patterns to examine how parents may prepare offspring for novel predators as they invade new environments. So therefore, the three-spine stickleback system is a nice, unique opportunity to study the causes and consequences of paternal care in an ecological and evolutionary context. So I just will mention, too, that we have found that fathers show behavioral plasticity in paternal care. So what I am showing you here on the uh, y-axis, this is time fanning a nest. And on the x-axis is um, just days after fertilization. If we expose males to a predator, either live or a model, in the lab or in the field, at about day four, males uh, reduce, their, uh, reduce their fanning, and it remains reduced compared to males that never experienced predation risk across the rest of the nesting cycle. 
So today I will talk about um, studies that aim to answer these three questions. So does parental experience influence offspring development? So do we see evidence of transgenerational plasticity? Are there shared mechanisms between transgenerational and juvenile developmental plasticity? And can parental experience facilitate rapid adaptation in the stickleback system? So to measure whether or not we see uh, transgenerational plasticity in stickleback, we um, de designed this within male um, designed experiment to expose fathers to predation risk. We randomly assigned males to either a predator or a no predator treatment. We allowed him to build a nest. This is the lovely nest. We allowed him to build a nest and spawn with a female. Three days after fertilization, Males in the predator treatment were exposed to a model sculpin. This is a predator that naturally occurs in the uh, river that these fish came from. And what we did was we have a small model predator that is a threat to the um, nest, but not to the father himself. We put this model in and chased him around for two minutes, and then we removed the predator. Males in the no predator treatment, we removed the top of the tank and gently splashed the water. At three days after fertilization, the offspring have not yet developed optic cups and they are completely covered by nesting material. So that in conjunction with using a model means that the uh, embryos themselves are not being exposed to either chemical or visual cues. We then allowed the males to um, parent normally and five days after the fry hatched, which is when they naturally disperse in the wild in this population, we took males from the predator treatment and assigned them, or no predator treatment, assigned to predator treatment and vice versa and we repeated the, um, the whole experiment. Um, 10 males completed one clutch. Of these, eight completed two clutches. Order was not a factor. Um, one of them that completed them was from predator, one was from no predator originally. Um, and we also did not see any carryover effects in paternal behavior. So if the males saw a predator in their first clutch, that did not affect how they parented in their second clutch. So we raised the offspring in the lab and we assayed them one year later when they were reproductively mature adults. So just to show you what we might predict, um, in the field, we see these uh, distinct differences between high predation and low predation fish. So for example, fish that come from high predation environments tend to be much smaller. They tend to have worse body condition, so unless you're really used to looking at sticklebacks, this is not a great picture, but this male is kind of scrawny and emaciated compared to this one. And males from high predation environments also tend to be um, distinctly less colorful and vibrant than males from low predation environments. So this is what we might expect to predict between these two um, situations. So when offspring were adults, I measured basic morphological traits, length, weight, and color in the males. And we also measured some behavior. Um, I'm only going to talk about one of the behaviors we measured today, but we placed them into this assay tank with a grid drawn on the front. After acclimation, we measured a behavior before the predator for three minutes to establish a baseline. Then we introduced this super realistic model <laughs> sculpin, um, and we had it sit on the ground for two minutes and then move around to simulate the sit and wait style of predation risk. And then we removed the predator and measured their behavior after to see if we could measure any recovery. And the behavior I'm gonna talk about today is total activity, which is just how many um, squares the fish visited during this time. So the first question, does father exposure to predation risk influence offspring morphology? Most of these graphs are going to look the same, so I'm just going to orient you now. Um, on the x-axis here, on the left, we're going to show the offspring of unexposed fathers. So I apologize, this is gonna be very adjective heavy for a little while. And then on the right, offspring of predator exposed fathers. So remember, these offspring themselves have never been exposed to predation risk before. The only experience they have is after they see the model. And on the y-axis here, I'm just going to show offspring length. We can see that offspring of predator-exposed fathers are actually significantly smaller than those of unexposed fathers. We also measure body condition. This dotted line indicates um, above the dotted line, you're kind of heavier for your size. Below, you are kind of scrawny for your size. And we also see that offspring of predator-exposed fathers are in worse condition after one full year. We also found that the male offspring of predator-exposed fathers were less colorful, as we might imagine. And then we wanted to know, what does the behavior look like? So this uh, graph is going to be slightly different. Here we're going to show before predator, during, and after exposure. And in blue are offspring of unexposed fathers, green offspring of predator exposed fathers. And as you can see here, at all three stages, including before the predator even arrives, um, offspring of predator exposed fathers are just less active overall. 
as we might expect if you are living in a predator-rich environment. So, um, to summarize, we found that morphology and behavior of offspring of predator-exposed fathers matched what we see in high predation populations. And I should also say that there have been plenty of studies in stickleback that directly expose juveniles to predator cues, and they also matched those uh, results as well. Fathers' experience with predation risk had long-term consequences for offspring. Remember here, we are measuring these as adults. This is one year after they have been parented. Um, and we are see still seeing uh, significant differences in behavior as well as morphology. So to conclude, um, these results suggest that there's evidence for transgenerational plasticity in three-spine stickleback. So that's great. Um, everyone always wants to know, how are they doing it? Um, I would like to know that too. Um, some possible mechanisms that uh, we've been thinking about are paternal steroids. So males secrete steroid hormones via their gills. And as you saw in that video, what played of it, their, their face is really close to the nest while they're fanning. And they actually blow water over their gills and over the nest. Um, so it's possible that steroid hormones might be entering the eggs. Paternal odor, so male odor cues are known to influence female offspring imprinting on their fathers. And odor and steroids might also be transferred into the eggs via that spigen when they are gluing those proteins onto the nest. And of course, paternal behavior. So we know that fathers alter their behavior when they are exposed to predation risk, and this altered behavior may act to influence offspring. We have some correlational evidence that males that spent more time at the nest produced offspring that performed stronger anti-predator behavior. And we are currently interested in looking at um, various ways that brain development might be affected, uh, perhaps through epigenetic mechanisms such as small RNAs that might be um, leading these changes. So stay tuned for that. So what we want to know is, after this, is we were like, well, these phenotypes look very similar to, um, so phenotypes of transgenerational plasticity look very similar to phenotypes of juvenile developmental plasticity, um, as well as these just genetically high predation populations. So we want to know, are these phenotypes being produced by similar um, underlying mechanisms? And so what we did was we performed a two-by-two two split clutch design where we took fathers and we assigned them to either uh, predator exposure or no predator exposure, and we just exposed fathers in the same way as we did before, model predator three days post-fertilization for two minutes. We then split the clutch once they were um, five, five days old, and we randomly assigned them to either a predator exposed or no predator exposed treatment. And at two months of age, juveniles in the predator exposed treatment, we put this model predator into the tank and we chased them around randomly. Um, the time of day was random, um, two minutes, once a day for a week. So they had slightly more chronic, they had more chronic exposure than the, uh, the fathers did. When they were three months of age, so here they're juveniles, they're not adults, we collected whole brains for RNA-seq from all of the treatment groups. And today I'm mostly going to focus on these two um, groups here. So here where the father does not experience uh, risk, but his um, offspring does, we call this juvenile developmental plasticity. And when the father experiences risk, but his offspring do not, that's transgenerational plasticity. So what we wanted to know first is, do juvenile developmental plasticity and transgenerational plasticity phenotypes differ? So what I'm showing you here is essentially what you just saw before. We replicated the results of our previous study, which was a huge relief for me. Um, the differences are not quite as pronounced. Keep in mind that these are three-month-old juveniles and not adults. Um, and then when you actually look at the juveniles that were exposed to predation risk, you get this really nice um, demonstration that these phenotypes match exceedingly well. And something that might be interesting to note that I would be also, I've been thinking a lot about that I would be interested to talk to people about is there doesn't seem to be an additive effect when they get this sort of double whammy of both their father's experience and their own experience. There seems to be some sort of um, floor effect here. So we want to know, like, do, do, do transgenerational plasticity and juvenile developmental plasticity, hard to say those, share patterns of gene expression? So when we look at the RNA-seq results from the brains, so what I'm showing you here is um, a Venn diagram, and these are the numbers of genes that were unique to transgenerational plasticity, number that were unique to juvenile developmental plasticity, and this number in the middle right here, this is the nice genes that are shared between these two different forms. And it's greater than you would expect by chance, and that's really nice. They share a lot of genes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are doing the same thing. One could, they could be upregulated in one and downregulated in the other. 
So then we looked at the patterns of regulation for these, and we thought we did something wrong. Because what I'm showing you here is a heat map. Each line of these, this is a gene you might be used to looking at heat maps. Red is upregulated, blue is downregulated, and they are remarkably concordant with one another. Um, we analyze this, reanalyze this. Um, so we are pretty excited about this result. Um, it seems to be that, the diff that gene expression in the brain is doing remarkably similar things between transgenerational and juvenile developmental plasticity, even though these cues are exceedingly different. Some genes that may be of interest, um, we found two copies upregulated of SMCHD1, which uh, performs epigenetic regulation of the brain, brain methylation, um, downregulation of TRB3, implicated in regulation of integrated stress response, oops, and MPTX2 um, was upregulated, which is implicated in synaptic plasticity learning and memory. So um, we found that phenotypes of predator-exposed offspring matched those of offspring of predator-exposed fathers. Transgenerational plasticity and juvenile developmental plasticity shared similar gene expression patterns, which suggests similar phenotypic plasticity pathways may be co-opting multiple cues. And the mechanisms for actually reaching these um, similarities in gene expression can be a wide variety of different things, and we are um, looking into some of the um, regulatory factors and potentially small RNAs as well um, that might be leading to these similar gene expression patterns. So finally, we know that fathers can influence their offspring. We know that they are doing very similar things in the brain to offspring as, off, as juveniles do themselves when they are directly exposed to novel environments. So finally, we, I wanted to ask, can parental experience facilitate this rapid adaptation of stickleback? So to do this, I collected stickleback from multiple populations in Alaska. I collected uh, populations from two marine, um, the, remember these are the ancestral populations, from three, what I'm going to call new freshwater populations, these are populations that were experimentally seeded um, anywhere from two to 30 years ago. We know the exact age of these, which is really nice. And then four, from what I'm going to call established freshwater populations. These are just populations that, for as long as records have been kept, have had stickleback living in them. We measured all males in freshwater to simulate marine colonization. And on the left here, this is a large marine male fanning his nest next to a smaller derived male fanning his nest. Um, we measured parenting behavior 10 minutes per day, every day of the nesting cycle. When eggs were three days old, instead of introducing a model sculpin, here we introduced a live dragonfly larvae. So this predator is only found in fresh water and has been shown to exert pretty significant selective pressure on stickleback. We introduced it for five minutes and recorded behavior. We tethered the larvae so that it could not actually access and harm the nest. So first, do marine and freshwater populations differ in parenting behavior? These graphs are relatively similar to the other ones. On the left is always going to be marine, intermediate, um, so the new freshwater, and then the established freshwater. We found that, indeed, marine males fanned more and spent more time at the nest, even more so than these, um, intermediate, than these new populations, some of which are only a couple of generations old. We also wanted to know if marine and freshwater males differed in how they reacted to the freshwater predator. And here we have this nice gradient where the marine males are not actually paying that close attention to it, um, but the freshwater males really do not like it being in there, um, with these new populations somewhere in between. And then finally, we wanted to ask if behavioral plasticity differed across marine and freshwater males. So remember, this alteration of paternal care might be influencing offspring developmental trajectories. So what I did here was I calculated the percentage change in the proportion of time fanning when the no novel predator was in the tank. Zero means that there is no change. And the marine males, on average, do not show a change when this novel predator is in the tank, whereas in these established freshwater populations, they are significantly reducing their time fanning with, again, these newer populations somewhere in the middle. However, we want to take a closer look at what this actually meant if these males were just literally doing nothing. So we want to know if males from different populations responded to the predator in the same way. So what I'm showing here is I'm going to show some reaction norms before the predator and while the predator is in with the proportion of time spent fanning the nest. And the marine males are kind of all over the place. Um, some of them are increasing their fanning, whereas for both the newer and the established freshwater populations, they pretty much stop fanning altogether. So, uh, to summarize, 
We found that marine males differed from freshwater males in parental behaviors even after only a couple of generations. The marine males did not overall react to the predator as if it were a threat, and marine males did not alter their, parental, their paternal care dramatically during predator exposure. So not recognizing odonate larvae as a threat and failing to alter parental behavior appropriately can have strong fitness consequences. So it is perhaps not surprising that males from these well-established populations, or even ones that have only been in there for a couple of generations, um, have, are dramatically decreasing their parenting when the predator is present. So further, marine males showed more variation in response to freshwater predator predators, suggesting that ancestral variation in response to this may be providing trajectories on which selection can then act. So taken together, these results suggest that there might be genetic differences among populations in response to invertebrate predation that have the potential to influence offspring phenotypes. Although even if these differences are plastic, they can still be altering their offspring phenotypes. So them ha this uh, variation having a genetic basis is actually not necessary um, for the persistence in these novel freshwater environments. So to go back to the original question, can plasticity within a generation, parental experience, facilitate rapid adaptation? So I've shown you that individual fathers plastically adjust their parenting to meet ecological challenges. We have data that they also adjust their uh, parenting in different ways based on levels of competition as well as the amount of females that are available to them. And that a father's experiences during parenting has lifelong consequences for offspring morphology and behavior. Um, changes in offspring's phenotype with father's experience, and the father's experience is from clutch to clutch. So if he saw a predator in his first clutch and not in his second clutch, you can tell those half-siblings apart just by their morphology and behavior. Whether or not these are well-suited or adaptive still needs to be tested, but the patterns are consistent with what we see in high predation populations and juvenile developmental plasticity. And similar pathways between these two may be co-opting multiple cues to arrive at similar phenotypes. And I want to just also remind you that this is extremely transient. We showed these males, this predator, for two minutes at one point in offspring development, and we are seeing dramatic changes over a year later. When compared across populations, behavioral plasticity in response to predation risk from a freshwater predator increased with increasing population age and thus familiarity with the predator, suggesting that selection has acted on freshwater predator recognition. So more variation in responses in the ancestral population suggests that such trajectories, as I mentioned before, can provide avenues for selection to act that can also have um, cascading influences on offspring development. So can behavioral plasticity and paternal care facilitate a rapid adaptation? These results suggest that fathers from natural populations can transmit information about the current environment to their offspring via very short-term adjustments in paternal behavior, and that, this shares, yeah, and that this shapes offspring's developmental trajectories well into adulthood. So altogether, my results suggest that parental behavior might have facilitated the radiation of three-spine sticklebacks by allowing these populations to persist in novel environments and provides a promising framework for the study of plasticity's impacts on evolutionary and ecological processes. And I have just a couple more minutes, so I would like to talk a little bit about some new, oh, I don't? Okay, I don't. So um, I thought I did based on my time here. So I'm going to leave it at that. I have started doing some new studies with this in another system, the uh, Trinidadian guppy, that also has, is remarkably well suited for this, looking at non-behavioral maternal effects. Um, spoiler alert, they show almost the exact same patterns, and I would love to talk about this with anybody who is interested in how this differs between their high and low predation populations. So I'd like to acknowledge everyone and for you for sitting through a talk that went too long. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions um, when I see you out there afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering about the brains of the adult males and whether you did any RNA seek on them and whether you see the same genes light up. Right. So we do. <laughs> so yes, um, we do actually have some data on what the fathers look like, 
And they also, we are currently looking into how these, uh, how just transiently seeing a predator will affect um, gene expression. So we, so these are baseline levels. These are not after they have seen a predator. So what we're really interested in as well is seeing if transient um, exposure to predation risk shows similar patterns. And I will get back to you on that. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. So Karen and I share not only an interest in how phenotypic plasticity affects ecosystems, but also in our preference for Mac. So apologies for the rearrangement here. I sometimes take this back to the There we are. All right. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Our final speaker of our morning session before the panel is Dr. Holly Moeller. Holly completed her PhD at Stanford under the advisement of our friend, Dr. Tadashi Fukami. She went on to an NSF postdoc at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, followed by her current role as a Biodiversity Research Center postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia. In just a few months from now, Holly will begin her appointment as an assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Holly describes herself as a community ecologist, biological oceanographer, and theoretical ecologist. Her research has spanned the study of partner diversity in tree ectomycorrhizal fungi, mutualisms, the bioenergetics of a marine ciliate, biological applications of optimal control theory, and the environmental maintenance of mixotroph within communities. These diverse interests are bound by the common theme of acquired metabolic potential, which we'll be hearing more about in a moment, and by Holly's research approach, which merges the mathematical and experimental. Beyond these research interests, Holly is an avid science writer for the public. Among other outlets, for nearly a decade, she wrote an impassioned and award-winning environmental opinion column in the Stanford Daily. So please join me in welcoming my fellow friend of the fungi, Dr. Holly Moeller. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jill, for such a warm introduction. I appreciate it. Um, am I audible in the back like this? Great. If I ever stop to be, dramatic gestures are appreciated. Um, so thank you all for being here and for the invitation to be part of this symposium. It's really an honor to be one of the many exciting talks about the diverse and, and really intensive research on phenotypic plasticity. And this, for me, has also given me the opportunity to think about my work on acquired metabolism through a new lens of how this may allow organisms to respond to different environmental conditions. So today I'm going to talk about another way that behavior can modulate the plasticity of an organism, particularly how organisms can acquire new forms of metabolism within their lifetime. And although I'm not an evolutionary biologist by training, I find myself drawn to start with this quotation from Darwin. And Darwin writes at the very end of Origin of the Species, famously about the entangled bank. And he describes really beautifully the elaborately constructed forms of different living organisms and how they interact in really complex and intricate manners. And I think one reason that I personally, and you'll have to forgive a bit of professional cynicism here, am drawn to this quotation time after time is that Darwin's eloquence temporarily obscures the fact that all the complexity he describes makes our jobs as ecologists really, really hard. Right? A major challenge in ecology today is to develop a predictive theory for where organisms are found and functionally what they're doing in those ecosystems. Now, one way that over the last 100 years we've tried to, if you will, disentangle the tangled bank is by focusing on the concept of the niche. And this was first formalized by Grinnell when he focused on the adaptations that organisms have to their environments. And through subsequent iterations of this concept, we know that the niche is shaped by both biotic and abiotic features and by how organisms interact with one another to partition resources along a multidimensional space. In particular today, I want to focus on the concepts of the fundamental and realized niche and how organisms can expand or contract their fundamental niches in different environments. And this work was illustrated really beautifully by Connell in the 60s. And Connell very cleverly took advantage of a clear gradient in abiotic or non-living stress in the intertidal. For an intertidal organism, the closer you live to the high tide line, 
the more stress you experience because you're out of water, exposed to heat stress, desiccation, and so on. And Connell showed for two species of barnacles that they differed in their fundamental niches, that is, their fundamental abilities to tolerate this stress. In particular, he showed that Thalamus, diagrammed here in brown, had a wider range of tolerance than did Semibalanus in blue. However, when we actually go out into the intertidal and look at the distributions of these barnacles, it's clear that there's vertical zonation among them. And in particular, what's happening here is that Semibalanus is com competitively dominant to Thalamus, which means that it constrains the realized niche where we actually find Thalamus into a relatively narrower, rich, narrower region than its fundamental niche. So we often think about species interactions as having this constraining effect, whereby you go from a broader fundamental niche into a smaller realized one. But what about scenarios in which species interactions can actually allow you to expand upon your fundamental niche? And one way in which this can happen is through what I call acquired metabolism. So let's think of our niche space now as metabolic space, the types of substrates that you can take up, the ways that you can get energy. And I'm going to define acquired metabolism as the metabolism that rather than being hard-coded in your DNA, you somehow gain access to within your lifetime through interactions with another species. So in our cartoon of a blue and brown species here, if our blue species were to acquire metabolism from the brown one, it would expand its metabolic niche with implications, of course, not only for itself, but also for the brown species with which it's now a competitor. One classic example of acquired metabolism are corals. Corals are heterotrophic animals like you and I. So they need a source of food to grow and reproduce. And in many parts of the world's oceans, like in the Darwin Mounds um, diagrammed here, pictured here on the left, Corals live heterotrophically by filter feeding other living organisms out of the water column, digesting them, and growing. But when I say the word corals, probably what comes to mind is something more like the picture on the right, right, of these hot spots of biodiversity that we find in the world's tropical, shallow, warm oceans. Now, in these waters, we're talking about oceans that are relatively nutrient depleted. There's not a lot of life in that water column, which is actually why they're a great place to snorkel and dive, because the water is so clear. But for a coral, that means that there's not a lot of food. But corals have nonetheless been able to thrive here by forming mutualistic partnerships with algae called Symbiodinium or zooxanthellae. So if we zoomed in on a coral polyp, you see this brown-green coloration that's actually the algal cells living inside the animal tissue and photosynthesizing. And some of the carbon that these algae fix through photosynthesis goes on to feed the coral animal. So through acquiring metabolism through this partnership, Corals have expanded upon their fundamental heterotrophic niche to colonize parts of the world's oceans we would not normally expect to find a filter-feeding heterotroph. And it's worth noting that um, these algae actually appear to confer at least some degree of phenotypic plasticity to their coral host. We know now that different algal clades respond differentially to temperature environments. And so by turning over their com um, complement of algal partners, some corals exhibit some degree of plastic response to changing ocean um, conditions and warming oceans. Now, this is what we would call a metabolic mutualism, but that's just one mechanism through which organisms can acquire metabolism. Other mechanisms include horizontal gene transfer, where you actually get the machinery that encodes for a metabolic pathway, and also organelle retention, where you actually take pieces of equipment from other organisms and then use them for yourself. And given these various mechanisms, it's not surprising that we find examples of acquired metabolism spread throughout the tree of life. In fact, even we humans rely on acquired metabolism in the complement of gut microbiota that help us digest certain foods, synthesize certain enzymes, and uh, vitamins, and so on. <clears throat> and all of this um, acquired metabolism confers a certain degree of phenotypic plasticity on the organisms. For example, we know that mammals that eat different diets have different complements of gut microbes. And many of these organisms, by forming associations with or getting metabolic potential from different sources, are able to adapt and acclimate to different environmental conditions. In particular today, the form of acquired metabolism that I want to focus on is organelle retention. And I'm going to talk in particular about organisms that are actually able to steal chloroplasts from the food that they eat and become photosynthetic. Um, and this is important because this illustrates not only what I think is a mind-blowingly cool metabolic ability, but also the endosymbiotic process that gave rise to the diversity of extant eukaryotic photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms on the planet. 
So photosynthesis, we believe, was actually an innovation of a bacterium. And at some point, the cyanobacterial cell got eaten by a heterotroph and permanently incorporated as the chloroplast, leading to two major lineages of algae, the greens of which gave rise to all of the um, diversity of land plants. And the um, remaining species actually, in some cases, underwent a secondary endosymbiotic event in which yet another heterotroph ate one of these organisms, sequestered its chloroplast permanently, and gave rise to this tremendous extant diversity of eukaryotic phytoplankton all over the planet. And actually, about half of primary production happens in Earth's marine systems. So these guys are playing a major biogeochemical role as well. But endosymbiosis isn't a process that stopped millions of years ago. It's ongoing today. And there are lots of examples of organisms that still um, have developed this ability to transiently retain plastids and become photosynthetic. And these are what we call the acquired phototrophs. And I love this slide because it highlights uh, some of the diversity and I think the charisma of these microbiota. And these are all unicellular protists that are found throughout the world's surface waters. We find them in marine systems, in estuarine systems, in fresh waters. And these guys are actually photosynthetic not because they have native machinery, but rather because they acquire photosynthesis through an interaction with another species. So focusing in particular on the organism pictured front and center, this is a ciliate that we call Mesodinium rubrum. You can see some of the cilia coming off of its midsection here. Actually, if you look at um, an electron micrograph of it, it looks like this double hula skirt that it uses for swimming. And Mesodinium captures cryptophyte algal prey. And um, when it captures one of these cells, it engulfs it, plucks out the chloroplast, and becomes photosynthetic. So whoever's going to have any lettuce in your lunch today, I want you to remember these guys and maybe feel a little bit jealous. I know I do. Um, so let's unpack exactly what's going on here a little bit more. And one of the people who's worked on this extensively is this guy, Matt Johnson, who's actually been a collaborator of mine now for more than 11 years. Um, and Matt is a protistologist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and just has an encyclopedic knowledge of these types of organisms. And what his work has shown is that when mesodinium captures one of these prey cells, it actually steals not only the chloroplast, diagrammed here with the green oval, but also the nucleus, diagrammed by a yellow circle. And these nuclei are transcriptionally active in the new host, which means that mesodinium rubrum can behave very much like a true phototroph in that it has the phenotypic plasticity to acclimate to different light levels. It can synthesize chlorophyll, it can divide its plastids, it can change the arrangement of its photosystems, allowing it to respond to different light environments. However, remember that this is a transient acquisition. And so over time, what happens is that plastid actually, um, the nucleus actually breaks down, which means that mesodinium loses control of its plastids and it needs to feed again to continue to grow. Now, as we've come to understand more about the physiology of this system, still there remain questions about its ecology. And what's interesting about mesodinium rubrum, and one of the reasons that it's attracted a tremendous amount of attention, is because it is a bloom former. Now, blooms are local rapid increases in biomass. In the case of mesodinium rubrum, they can be intense enough to actually color the water at the scale of kilometers. So I've got an example here from the Columbia River estuary and one visible by satellite. You can see these red swirls of water off the coast of Africa. And when mesodinium rubrum is blooming, it's contributing the majority of microplankton primary production. So it's basically setting the table for higher trophic levels in these ecosystems. And we might ask ourselves how it can achieve this tremendous ecological success basically working with stolen goods. And in order to address that question, I worked both with Matt Johnson, whom you saw before, and also with Mike Newbert, who's a theoretical ecologist also in Woods Hole. And we developed a mathematical model that describes this system. And this model begins with our phytoplankton prey, the source of this photosynthesis, that has a growth rate and a mortality rate and which shares the water column with our consumer, with our mesodinium cell. And when there's a predation event, that consumer acquires photosynthesis and now is able to use the energy of sunlight for growth and reproduction. Now, because this is a temporary acquisition, we imagine that new daughter cells produced through photosynthetic growth come out in the heterotrophic state and must feed again to acquire chloroplasts for themselves. And of course, there's mortality for our consumer as well. So now I have a model of two species that both depend upon light for their growth. 
and it's going to be competition for light together with this predation mechanism that lead to the population dynamics we observe when we look at this model's um, behavior. So the, um, let me show you what those population dynamics look like for a range of different light intensities. And the first thing to do with a mathematical model is to sort of do a gut check to convince yourself that it's not doing something crazy. And so what we did was run this model in total darkness and show that both of these populations fall to zero over time, which is what you expect because they both require light for growth. Now, if I turn up the lights a little bit, I get an equilibrium where only my phytoplankton prey diagrammed in green is present. And that's because when I parameterized this model, I made the assumption that the phytoplankton is better, more efficient at photosynthesis than the consumer. And that makes good intuitive sense because it's working with its own native equipment. And that also holds up really well to our experimental approaches, which I'll show you later. Now, if I continue to turn up the light, suddenly now our consumer is able to coexist. But interestingly, when the light levels get higher and higher, I see that equilibrium point destabilize in favor of a limit cycle. Um, so now I'm seeing a bloom of my phytoplankton here in green, followed by a bloom in my consumer. So what's happening is that these prey are getting grazed down by the consumer, which then has its own population boom photosynthetically, but runs out of this equipment, its population falls, and the cycle repeats. So this looks for those of you who work at the ecosystem scale a lot like what we call the paradox of enrichment, this phenomenon by which more productive ecosystems may have more volatile population dynamics. Now this model's predictions are strikingly, um, are very striking qualitatively. And so we might ask ourselves whether we can actually observe these types of dynamics in systems in the lab. And to address that question, we went into the lab and we grew Mesodinium rubrum with its cryptophyte prey species in co-culture at three different light levels. I'm gonna show you here on the left our experimental data based on the counts of these populations that we did over time. And on the right, what our model's predictions were. For simplicity's sake, on the y-axis, I'm just going to plot the ratio of phytoplankton prey to consumers so that we're only looking at one set of data points at a time. Now at the lowest light levels, I see this ratio increase exponentially over time. And that's because our prey cell, our phytoplankton, can grow, but our consumer, our mesodinium, doesn't have enough light to do so. At intermediate light levels, eventually this ratio levels off as these populations reach their stable equilibrium sizes. And at the highest light levels, I see first an increase as the phytoplankton prey come up, and then a decrease as our consumer grazes them down and its population goes up in time. So we had a relatively good match between our model's predictions and our experimental data, and so now we wanted to expand upon these results and ask about acquired phototrophy more broadly. And here's what I mean by that. It turns out that Mesodinium rubrum is pretty extreme on the spectrum of acquired phototrophs in that it gets more than 95% of its carbon and energy from photosynthesis and only a small amount from heterotrophy. Other examples of acquired phototrophs are more variable in this degree of reliance. For example, I have Dinophysis acuminata diagrammed here in blue, which by the way is a dinoflagellate that steals its chloroplast from Mesodinium in this very complicated hand-me-down scheme. Um, but dinophysis gets between 10 and 30% of its carbon from photosynthesis, depending on its light environment and prey availability, and the rest from heterotrophy. And we might ask ourselves how these varying degrees of reliance on acquired metabolism affect the population dynamics that we observe. And to address that question, we can go back to our mathematical model and incorporate heterotrophy, where we allow one of these predation events to lead directly to the growth of the heterotrophic state of our consumer. And then we can vary the fraction of predation events that go down either of these pathways as a proxy for the degree to which you rely on photosynthesis as opposed to heterotrophy. Now remember in particular that this phenomenon that we're trying to explain and, and really interested in is bloom formation, the setting the table for the rest of the food web. And we know from biological oceanography that blooms are typically triggered by changes in the abiotic or non-living features of the environment. In particular, our model explicitly considers the availability of light as a resource. And so what we did was force the model to have annual cycles in light availability, shown here at the top in this black line. And you can see that when I put only phytoplankton prey into the model, that in summer, when light availability is high, my phytoplankton biomass is high. And in winter, when light levels fall, my phytoplankton biomass does as well. Now, if I put Mesodinium rubrum into this model, once again, I see this phenomenon of sequential blooms. 
But interestingly, if I put in something that's more mixotrophic, maybe getting 30% of its carbon from photosynthesis and the rest from heterotrophy, or something that's entirely heterotrophic, I see qualitatively different dynamics. Note that there's still a phytoplankton bloom, although it's smaller in magnitude in these cases if you compare the scales of the y-axis. But here now my consumer does not have its own independent bloom. Rather, it seems to track the population dynamics of its prey. And this is broadly consistent with the observational data that we have from the world's coastal oceans, where Mesodinium rubrum blooms all over the world. In fact, we think Darwin uh, described a bloom in the voyage of the Beagle, uh, whereas these other taxa do not. And so this ability to so fundamentally transform your metabolism from heterotrophy to phototrophy gives you this ability to at least temporarily decouple your population dynamics from those of your prey leading to this ability to form these vast balloons. So it's clear that understanding acquired metabolism has some degree of importance for certain ecosystem functions. But we might ask ourselves how these organisms arise and how this plasticity metabolically is shaped um, over evolutionary history. And it turns out that the Mesodinium genus is a great system in which to ask these questions. I mentioned to you already Mesodinium rubrum but there's a closely related sister species called Mesodinium chameleon, and the basal lineage Mesodinium pulix, which is entirely heterotrophic. So this uh, genus is a great model system for endosymbiosis, and most recently we've been asking questions about how there may be biological trade-offs that couple your degree of reliance to your degree of prey specialization. And here's what I mean by this. Uh, Mesodinium rubrum has this very specialized mechanism by which it takes plastids and also nuclei and runs them in this very photosynthetically precise way. So we might imagine that that's driven it to a, a high degree of prey specificity, where there's only perhaps one type of prey from which it can get the necessary equipment. And indeed, that's what we find, both in the laboratory when we work with cultures of these organisms and in the field when we study which plastids they have in bloom settings where Mesodinium rubrum wants just one single particular prey species, although because it uses its equipment so well, it doesn't need to feed that often. And at the other end of the spectrum, our heterotroph eats just about anything you offer it, but needs to be continuously feeding in order to keep its population growing. We've been um, particularly keen um, in recent months to work on Mesodinium chameleon here in the middle, this intermediate species. And that's in part because chameleon actually gets its name from the fact that it changes color depending on the prey that you feed it. Um, so this light micrograph comes from a culture that we originally had fed blue-green algae and then changed to offer it a prey that was, were red. And you can see that, for example, this cell here is still just chock full of those green plastids. One of them has completely turned over its plastids to this new red option. And then you've got some that have a mouthful of each sort of in each cheek. Um, and Mesodinium chameleon, although it's relatively uh, more plastic in its ability to utilize different prey than is Mesodinium rubrum, nonetheless exhibits some degree of prey preference. In particular, if we offer it a variety of different prey in the lab, it grows better on some than on others. And incidentally, the prey that it does worst on happens to be the preferred prey of our specialist Mesodinium rubrum, suggesting some um, either um, driving uh, niche specialization, niche partitioning, or something that's resulted from this degree of reliance on acquired metabolism. And these differences in growth rate appear to be driven by differences in Mesodinium chameleon's ability to use these stolen chloroplasts. It takes up more plastids from its preferred prey, and it can hang on to them longer according to our quantitative PCR data. And we're working on doing some carbon budgeting to understand how it relies more on photosynthesis versus heterotrophy given these different options. So this suggests that there is um, some degree of niche partitioning going on both among prey, but also, interestingly, potentially in light environments as well. We know that uh, Mesodinium rubrum prefers relatively higher light environments than does chameleon. And recently, I've become really interested in trying to understand how this ability to use different prey species might affect chameleon's degree of flexibility because prey with different plastids, um, and in particular those different plastid colors, indicate the, pref uh, the presence of different photosynthetic molecules, uh, different chlorophylls and secondary pigments, which may impact the ways in which the ciliate can interact with light depending on the prey that it takes up. So some exciting future directions, hopefully to be funded, to work on there. 
So I've spent this talk focusing on one particular example of acquired metabolism, this very cool ability to transform yourself from being heterotrophic to phototrophic, given the right prey and the right conditions. But more broadly, I think acquired metabolism gives organisms an ability to be phenotypically plastic because they can then modify their fundamental niche to acquire metabolism that they don't necessarily genetically have access to. And given the wide spectrum of organisms that acquire metabolism, I think that this is potentially a really interesting avenue to explore phenotypic plasticity. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to continuing conversations about acquired metabolism, but also phenotypic plasticity more broadly and how it relates to community structure and function. I don't know if I've saved any time for... Is there any evidence of this in your system? Yeah, so um, to permanently acquire a plastid, typically what we see in these extant phytoplankton like dinoflagellates and coccolithophores and diatoms that have a permanently incorporated plastid is that there's some gene transfer um, between the, what would have been encoded in that, cyan that ancestral cyanobacterium and the genome of the new host, which allows it to regulate that photosynthetic machinery. Um, and for other acquired phototrophs, there's a lot of interest in looking for those gene transfers um, and some tentative evidence that that's ongoing. Mesodinium rubrum as a ciliate has a particularly difficult genome to work with, um, but we are in the process of sequencing it uh, with help from the Joint Genome Institute. And we will hopefully in another year or so have sequenced the genomes of those three species and be able to do some comparative analysis. And I think more so than expecting to see gene transfer, I imagine there will be changes in genome architecture that allow it to perform this degree of, of utilization of a totally novel metabolism. Great question. Like free trade markets, sorry, mm -hmm. it's like a free trade markets, and yeah. and and I could imagine that kind of dissociation relationship in the economic systems. I don't know whether or not that could happen in there, because either you see like eukaryotics is entirely one to one and and finally degenerate part of that, or either you see this kind of predate pred, predatory behavior. But I could imagine that if something that could just like mm -hmm. create more complex in interaction and have higher thinness. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, this gets to, so Jill described and alluded to some work that I did on fungal mutualisms, which indeed are a, a market where trees are offering carbohydrate to a, a variety of fungal partners that offer some resources in exchange. And so thinking about these as economic markets and exchanges is, has been a really fruitful way that we've been able to explore the evolution of mutualisms. Um, in the case of Mesodinium rubrum in particular, we're talking about a plastid that has now been taken out of its original host and is ultimately slated for digestion. So I find it very hard to argue that there's some selection on that. Um, to result in different exchange rates and things because that plastid isn't really going to carry on and, and pass on its genes or, or its um, exchange rates to a next generation. There are acquired phototrophs uh, like corals and like some of these protists that host uh, relatively intact endosymbionts, some of which can actually be re-isolated and reintroduced to the host. And that's a great example where you would expect selection to be acting on both players in this metabolic exchange. Is there any evidence in the wild that um, uh, these r symbiotic relationships like under low light conditions might, where, where the they, they may not consume the, the, the uh, uh, photosynthetic uh, prey? 
Yeah, so the question is about how these types of interactions, particularly when you have two, um, maybe an endosymbiosis or two independently evolving lineages, might degenerate into parasitic interactions and, um, and how an organism might modulate that perhaps by changing the way it interacts depending on light conditions. And indeed, many acquired phototrophs appear to be plastic in the degree to which they rely on photosynthesis. So I showed you um, that spectrum of reliance, and some had much wider bars than others. And that has a lot to do with light environment, where you'll see these organisms become relatively more heterotrophic in low light environments and digest their plastids faster and sort of not rely as much on um, carbon from photosynthesis. Ask the last the, the speakers from the morning session to come down and join the panel. And while they get situated, we'll ask the audience to think about synthetic questions that you'd like the entire group to to answer or discuss. And not necessarily every um, speaker needs to address every question, but just think of questions that are broadly relevant to everyone's work. And I'm actually going to start us off with a question from the post-it notes that were put out, out um, in the hallway to give you a little bit more time to think about questions. So someone asked, should we expect an optimum phenotype considering all variable, how, how variable environments are? So. That's just, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, can everyone hear me up there now? Okay. Um, so um, optimum traits usually refer to uh, the presence of, of balancing selection where very high trait values are bad, very low trait values are bad, and somewhere in the middle, uh, that's, that's preferred. Um, there are, um, you can think of traits where there are gonna be physiological limits um, on either side of the trait value where an organism can't survive if it has no, um, uh, I don't know, so, some integral trait like uh, for a plant like cell wall integrity or something, but also uh, cell walls that are too rigid and um, could cause problems as well. So um, there's physiological limits that could, could sort of inherently set optimum trait values. Is that what the question was getting at? I don't know who asked it. <laughs> yeah, I, sorry, I, yeah, I guess um, the optimum may also relate to um, like what's the frequency of the environmental change matters. Um, like probably, especially um, within generation change versus between generation change, I think the optimum may be um, quite different. In, uh, so. okay. Yeah, and I think another important aspect of this is that this can also drive speciation potentially, right? If there are different optima and it's too hard to maintain the plasticity to adapt to different environments within the same genotype. So with uh, species concepts are tricky with, with microbes, but with the mesodinium genus, this um, speciation along these lines of reliance on photosynthesis may be indicative of perhaps this inability to be perfectly flexible to different environmental conditions. Um, and just going to a more plant defense sort of framework, in general, you're thinking about space, like spatiotemporal variability in general, that changes all the time. But there's some work out there essentially showing modeling work that variation itself um, can be selected for. Like variation is difficult for an individual herbivore to be able to deal with and navigate. So having a whole host of different things on the landscape can actually 
be a resistance response itself more at a population kind of level. So it's just a different perspective. Should we move to a question from the audience? Um, I wonder if you, any of you think that there could be some specific property of plastic, plastic genes, um, such as we know that there's male-female dimorphism, like so it's already kind of, some genes are already kind of plastic um, in the population. Would those genes um, be more plastic when the environment change? versus the genes that don't have that property. Um, yeah, I think um, sexual dimorphism seems an important topic of phenotypic plasticity. Um, uh, I think in my view, it was um, could be like same genome or in different environment. One environment is male versus one environment is female. Um, and yeah, I think they need to do different roles, like what's the optimal expression for male versus for female. Um, and I think it, so on top of that, if we have environmental change, um, probably makes more complicated like mm -hmm environment by environment interactions. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. So it could be also the, yeah, the, the dynamic of sexual selection may also differ in different environment. So it could be like multiple different kind of selection play a role. Um, right, I think that seems worth to discuss. <laughs> Yeah, I think that this is a really interesting question. So you mentioned sexual dimorphism in particular, um, but I think that one of your sort of major questions was, are some genes more susceptible to being plastic than others? And I think that's something that's really interesting to think about is for these flexible gene networks and what we might expect to be more flexible in certain environments or for certain organisms, depending on their biology. So like you mentioned, sexual dimorphism, maybe we see more flexibility in gene networks and constitutively versus plastically expressed um, genes in males versus females and then across differing environments. And I think looking at sensitivity of certain genes and gene networks in response to the environment um, and maybe being able to predict when we might expect these, as sort of say, like gene expression to be plastic versus constitutively expressed is, um, is a really interesting question that um, is being explored uh, a bit in the uh, neurogenomic literature, but I'm not um, as familiar with, with other literatures like um, in plants or things that don't have brains. <laughs> Um, okay, so my, I guess uh, one thing that I'm interested in is that you know you guys have um, talked about plasticity from various diverse perspectives, uh, but I think one common theme that I, I see is that um, that there's there's variation in plasticity either um, or within species or between species in in various ways, and so I'm I'm curious for the systems that you all work in, what your thoughts are on uh, the relative importance of the costs of, of being plastic in general, as opposed to um, why we don't see a single generalist strategy uh, taking over and, and why we see this maintenance of variation, you know, and what role costs might play. I guess I'll start. Um, so in, in Bukhara, I haven't, uh, I, at least during the time that I was working on this during my during grad school, I never detected any sort of cost of plasticity directly. 
Um, in, in my system, so one of the subspecies has highly reduced plasticity compared to the other subspecies in, in glucosinolate trait expression. Um, and we don't know why this happened. Um, one hypothesis is that um, for some reason, the typical habitats occupied by the Western subspecies, um, it tends to be better to, um, to have a consistent glucosinolate profile no matter what, uh, where you're growing. And in Bukhara, the plasticity um, among different habitats, I, I will add um, that Bukhara has a very small dispersal rate, like half a meter or so. And so we wouldn't expect that plasti for plasticity between an habitats to ever, ever really evolve um, as an adaptation in itself. Um, however, that plasticity is highly correlated with plasticity within and on the meter scale within a single habitat. So um, it's possible it could be sort of a side effect of evolution in response to the small scale variation in the Western subspecies habitat versus the Eastern subspecies habitat. That's one hypothesis um, with no evidence to support it so far. <laughs> Um, but also it could just be, um, my other hypothesis, which I think might just be more likely, is that, well, first of all, these subspecies seem to be, uh, the divergence between them seems to be mostly driven by adaptation to water availability, um, where Western habitats are, are have much higher uh, water availability. Um, it's possible that um, this glucosinolate plasticity is actually not that evolutionarily important. Uh, for example, I within any given habitat, I never observed any sort of selection for you know, steeper reaction norms or anything like that. So that's not very important. Therefore, the, the Western subspecies was free to lose that as it was evolving adaptations to more, more important <laughs> environmental uh, challenges. Um, so within the, within the system that I'm working on, I actually did detect some of the cost trade-offs that you're talking about, but it only occurred in low nutrient conditions. So in high nutrient conditions, there weren't trade-offs between, say, tolerance and resistance. You didn't see it. It was only in um, kind of low nutrient conditions where you see kind of this cost trade-off. And I think within this system, it might go back to what I was talking to about uh, spatiotemporal variation. Um, it matters what your neighbor's doing, because, since these herbivores are mobile. So if you have neighbors that are inducing a resistance response and you don't, then your optimum response is different than if they don't induce an, a resistance response. And I didn't present this part of my dissertation work, but uh, essentially who you were paired with in those sandboxes um, mattered for both the ecosystem processes beneath them and for the competitive outcomes that were happening. So that's another layer on top. I felt like I was already adding a lot. But so I really do think that at least in sort of this plasticity in defenses, the context you're in in terms of your neighbor environment really determines what your potential optimal response is. So I think that this question about costs of plasticity is really interesting and could generate a whole discussion that could last all day, whether what we're <laughs> seeing are actually costs of plasticity or if anyone has seen anything that's like a true cost of plasticity. Um, what, so I think about this, when, during my dissertation with the stickleback, I thought a lot about can what we see in this system, is this generalizable or is there just something about the sticklebacks that make that, you know, they're just more plastic or more able to easily like live in new environments. Now with the guppies, it's, you know, sort of thinking in the same way comparatively, is there something strange about the system that makes them more plastic than others? Um, and, you know, anoles and all of these systems that we kind of use as vertebrate models for plasticity and evolution. I think that I can think of a lot of constraints on plasticity. Um, so for example, in the stickleback, if you stop parenting, your babies will die. If you parent all the time, then you can't do anything else. You're energetically limited. Same thing with the transgenerational effects that you see. You can't get um, smaller than a certain size without dying. So, um, you know, maybe those constraints, uh, the range of those constraints are um, more restricted or wider in certain species than others that might make them better able to, um, to exhibit plasticity in novel environments versus not. Um, and so that's sort of the way that, that I've been thinking about it. Um, what about their evolutionary history has led to potential constraints on plasticity and 
um, what does that say about the evolvability of plasticity in other species as well and their ability to um, adapt and colonize novel environments? Um, so one of the nice things about working on photosynthesis is that we think at least, and it seems clear that there's a lot of cost involved in producing photosystems. And there are mixotrophic organisms that actually have permanent plastids but also eat. And you can see that play out in, for example, why they're not dominant everywhere. Um, because they have to incur sort of the cost of maintaining two metabolic pathways. And in some ways, acquired phototrophy, where you can just steal someone else's hard work manufacturing these systems, is one way to circumvent those costs. Um, so something that I think about a lot, because my work spans the relatively fast timescales of microbes to long-lived organisms like trees and fungi, is how those costs are spread out over a lifetime and over the range of environmental conditions you might experience in that lifetime. Um, so for example, when you think about a tree that's investing below ground in fungal partners, uh, this is a long-lived organism with little motility to move from environments that it doesn't like to others. And so perhaps over the integral of decades of life, that cost of maintaining partners of variable quality that might be better in some conditions than others may be lowered once you look at the integral of the value of, of that acquisition. So I think um, time scales are important and the degree of heterogeneity that you might experience is important to, to really evaluating what the costs of that plasticity are. I think I don't have much to say. Um, it, um, yeah, in my case, I think even in the laboratory environment, we think the cost is relatively small, like um, without lots of ecological constraint. Um, but we still observe um, the initial plasticity seems disappear after a while. Um, so I totally agree with that. The cost may depend on when and the cons context. Um, initially, it could be beneficial, but um, once the benefit is giving is uh, is decreasing as they are adapting, um, then the cost may be uh, show up. Uh, so. Hi, um, thanks for the great talks, especially Molly's talk. <laughs> that makes me think of my protozoa. <laughs> I hope my protozoa is not is not behaving plastic plastically. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I guess my question is: um, I consider myself as a community eco ecologist, and I'm thinking species as a uh, just like a species. Their behavior are kind of identical, but your talk kind of talks kind of blew my mind. And I'm just wondering how important plasticity is in determining the community dynamics or uh, or put it in a more like plain English, how much variation considering plasticity can improve our understanding on either ecological functioning or the community functioning or at least the population dynamics. So like how deep we should go into the plasticity uh, comparing to like a more traditional or more conventional thinking in understanding the population dynamics, uh, community dynamics. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I thought about this a, de a decent amount because I also came from um, kind of a community world where I was thinking about individual species. And I guess, I think it depends on your system how much you have to worry about intraspecific variation. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence that genetically based intraspecific variation through that community genetics framework can structure, say, arthropod communities. So you can trace kind of genetic structuring of traits through the arthropod communities and dynamics that are happening. So there's really nice work on that. I would say when we move into the plasticity realm, which is sort of more what I was talking about, there's a little bit um, less of a developed way to think about it. We generally just kind of want to minimize that environmental variation instead of really par parsing it out. 
And I mean, I would say that at least in my work, it seemed like that environmentally based plasticity can account for just as much trait variation as the genotypes within a particular landscape. So to me, it seems pretty important to consider when you're looking at any of these studies, but probably the system you work in would change that. Yeah, I think, um, so I share a community ecology fascination with you, and as such, I'm really familiar with the term context dependent, <laughs> and, which is sort of our catch-all for something strange happened here and not here, and so, um, but yeah, I would echo that I think at the end of the day, what it comes down to are the questions that you're asking and the scale at which you're asking them. Um, for example, some of the most metabolically plastic things I can think of are bacteria, which do horizontal gene transfer, and the packaging of metabolic pathways within these bacteria is so fluid. And yet, if you're interested in the biogeochemistry of nutrient cycling in the ocean, it doesn't really matter knowing which species are where and how plastic they are. It matters more to say which genes are there and how much are they being expressed, and you can sort of just predict the outcome based on the initial conditions and some assumptions about which pathways are present or absent. So I think it, it comes down to the system you're working with and um, the scale at which you care about the individual population dynamics and whether you think that matters because